Gabe, thank you so much for joining Nonstop Nonprofit Podcast. How are you doing this morning? Or this afternoon, I should say. Yeah, it's afternoon here, <laughs> but yeah, doing amazing. Awesome. Well, I'm super excited to have you on the podcast and and for our listeners to learn a, a bit more about you and Virtuous. And so excited to kind of talk about a new partnership we're launching here uh, and a little bit more about your company. Uh, but before we dive into that, would love just a, a quick background on yourself as an entrepreneur that's turned towards the nonprofit industry. Tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, what got you started at Virtuous. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I'm actually a a product guy by trade. Like I love creating beautiful products that are really easy to use and, and started as a software developer, but developed this passion for generosity over time. So I worked it in the nonprofit space for a little while, and then spent a lot of time doing technology consulting for nonprofits and just began to see the power of generosity, not just for creating good in the world. So not just like you know, fixing sex trafficking or, or saving dogs, but also the power to shift the heart of the giver. So just realize more and more that when we give our time, our talent, our social capital, our money, something changes inside us and makes us a better person. And I think that passion for product and passion for generosity lined up. So, you know, founded Virtuous almost eight years ago now, just with this goal to increase global generosity and specifically to increase global generosity by bringing donors closer to the cause or helping nonprofits build more personal relationships with their donors. And so, yeah, that's kind of been my life mission for the last 15, 20 years. Awesome. And uh, that's culminated most recently uh, into Virtuous. And so tell us a little bit about company Virtuous and the problems you guys are solving. Yeah. So we like to call ourselves a responsive fundraising platform. And so what that means is we want to create a, a tech stack, a platform and some playbooks and an amazing team of people that help nonprofits build better personal relationships with donors. And what that looks like sort of on the ground is kind of a modern CRM. That's more of an offensive weapon for generosity, a full marketing stack. So email marketing, text, mail, all of sort of your normal marketing channels but also includes things like volunteer management and uh, what we call donor signals. So what are the ways that we can listen to our donors better at scale to understand who they are? We bring all those tools together under one roof to help our amazing nonprofits grow generosity. So we're, we're located in Phoenix, Arizona, though only half of our team uh, works here. I think looking out in our office today, we maybe have 50 people sitting in desk out in our office, but the rest of our team spread out all over the country. And yeah, uh, what else is important about us? Well, we, most of the nonprofits we work with are, we would call like mid to large nonprofits. I think if you're sort of a tiny nonprofit, there's some great sort of inexpensive tools out there to use, but most of the people we serve are really trying to like go big with sophisticated marketing, direct response, fundraising, um, major donor teams. And we love serving those kind of organizations. Awesome. Amazing. You know, obviously both of us working in the nonprofit space, uh, you know, we have our ears to the floor uh, in terms of just what's, what's happening, what's going on, or, or as much as we can, at least with sort of where everything is at the headwinds of 23 fear around a recession. What are you hearing from nonprofits, uh, whether it's your customers or, or prospects in terms of what their needs are? Like how can we best support nonprofits going into a potentially you know, challenging economic climate over the next year or so? It's a great question. I mean, I think there's good news and bad news. The bad news is when, you know, milk is more expensive at the grocery store and people's stock portfolios are down, people are just, they hold cash tighter, right? Which if your, if your job is fundraising, that can be really hard. And so I don't want to minimize that, you know, uh, we'll see how the total giving shakes out this year, but I expect it to be, you know, pretty flat. We had a, an amazing year or two through COVID and giving and, and certainly don't expect those kind of increases again, which is hard. I think the really good news is though, and, and Justin, we've talked about this before, but uh, you know, uh, giving is in a sense recession proof. Like as a percentage of GDP, Americans gave more during the Great Depression than just about any other time, right? And so people are generous during hard times. Now you have to be empathetic when you make the ask and you have to understand that your donors are going through challenges. But I think the best nonprofits are finding ways to get innovative and step up even during hard times to be able to support their causes. So 
I'm, you know, it's, it's not going to be easy for the next year, but I'm confident that the best organizations are going to be able to inspire generosity in some cool ways. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's interesting as, as I was doing some research on sort of like Black Friday trends mm. and there, there's not necessarily like a strong correlation, you know, to, to Giving Tuesday and, and some of the other big, bigger giving days other than, you know, at the end of the day, whether you're buying something or donating, you're a consumer. And it was interesting, like reading through like the Shopify, at least report analysis, you know, they were they were seeing like three point five million dollars purchased through Shopify sites every minute during Black Friday and it actually grew Black Friday sales by over 20 percent. Uh, on the on the Shopify platform, which I was actually surprised, but I was expecting, you know, it to be a little bit more flat, given uh, sort of like, like you mentioned, uh, just sort of the increase in twenty one from the pandemic and so forth. But what what and and we're seeing something kind of similar in 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 our numbers as well, with, as as it relates to, to individual giving. Now it's not obviously the full picture. There's a lot more happening kind of behind the scenes, but it's it's definitely interesting. And I think tomorrow will be a really important data point. And as we look towards like end of year giving how you know that's going to shake out for for the nonprofit community. Uh, I'm hopeful it's it remains positive, but we'll see I guess what happens here in in the coming weeks for sure. And I think like like good organizations will be able to understand that, you know, some segment of your donors if all of their planned gifts were sitting in tech stocks, like that that check will likely yeah. be smaller, right? Or yeah. if it was in crypto, like we we as a nonprofit space, we received a decent amount of crypto. I mean, it wasn't like outrageous, but we saw yeah. a lot of people make money in crypto and give some of that money away. We're not going to see that again this year. Like that, that money has gone away, but like money and people's donor advice funds, like, or that, that 50, a hundred dollar month giver, that's just faithful year over year. Like those people still have jobs and they're still generous. Right. And yep. so you sort of have to understand who you're talking to during a time like this. But I think the bulk of the giving is still there and people aren't any less generous this year than they were last year. Right. No, absolutely. And I think you made a good point too, like talking about sort of giving being more re recession resilient, right? And, and you, you talked about like the data point from like the Great Recession. I think also you look at, or I think the Great Depression is what you referenced. Uh, the, if you look at the Great Recession, when the S&P fell 40%, you know, giving only fell about seven, six or seven percent. And so right. you do see, you do see, you know, I, I kind of look at like giving in the same category as like dog food, right? Like you never see dog food go down no matter what the <laughs> economic climate is because you have to feed your dog. And I think giving because it's so emotional, right? It makes you, even if like, even if it's tougher to give that hundred dollars or that a thousand dollars or that ten thousand dollars, the feeling that you get after giving it's hard to replace that. And you like that control, you know? And so I, I think that's, that's part of what makes giving so recession resilient is how the individual feels after the fact, being obviously deeply invested in, in the causes that they care about and so forth is, is a factor, of course. Uh, but just the emotional aspect of giving, I think is, it's a lot less logical than, than it is emotional uh, to, to many yeah. donors. The reality too is like consumerism is sometimes a distraction to giving. When we're when everybody's flush and everything's going well and you're buying all the newest gadgets, sometimes you don't think about your neighbor who's hurting, but it's, hmm. we saw this during COVID when people were, you know, in, in some of the social unrest and now mo most recently the war in Ukraine where people are looking at the outside world and they're sort of like keenly aware of the problems around them and something in them switches and it makes them more generous. And so it's, you know, there's something magical about, people understanding the pain of others that makes them more generous. And that, that increases arguably in a recession. It doesn't decrease. Hmm. Interesting. So conversely, I'd like to talk about some trends that, that you and I are both seeing in the nonprofit space over the last couple of years. You know, um, some of the things that obviously we're seeing being more, more payments focused as, as a business is we're seeing, you know, a lot of, a lot of appetite for uh, so increased ways to give to making it, you know, making it easy for your donor to give or per making it possible for donor to give any way possible. Now, I think that there's definitely, a, there should be a ceiling to that because if you have too many options, you get, you get, you know, fatigue around which one do I actually choose? But obviously there's, there are the newer items like crypto, uh, lots, lots of like stock donations coming to market, you know, just making stock gifting easier, probably not the best time since, you know, the markets are taking a hit, but regardless, making it so that you don't have to go through brokers and fax machines to, to donate stock. 
And we're, we're seeing a lot, a lot of things around uh, like mobile wallets, just incorporating wallets into like the giving experience. And then just also like an, a, another aspect, another trend that I feel like, and I, I've, I actually think this stems more from COVID, but it, it should have been earlier is just sort of like the feedback loop of like what happens after this gift is made? How does the nonprofit like provide the, the feedback to, to the donor on how the funds are being used, how the impact is is being shaped at the organization as a result of the support? Some things that we're seeing more nonprofits ask about and pay attention to. Curious that on your end, what trends are you seeing? Uh, anything new or is it more just doubling down on the things that you know nonprofits should be focusing on? Yeah. I mean, I'll start with this is, is we always talk about if you shift the how of giving, you can see single digit increases in giving. If you shift the why of giving, you can see massive sort of exponential increases in giving. And so by that, I mean, yes, you should take the friction out of the giving process, like make it easy for people to give via Venmo or PayPal, like make it easier for them to give stock, right? Like take the friction out of the how and you're going to make your donors happier, create a better experience, and you'll see a lift in giving. But it's probably only going to be sort of a single digit lift in giving. By like adding Venmo to your, your giving experience, everybody should have that. Also, it's not going to increase giving by 50% having Venmo, right? But if you can shift the why, like what moves people's hearts to, to move from, you know, as our friend Tim Kachiriak says, it's moving somebody from yes to heck yes. Like it's how do you really get them to be sacrificially generous, which kind of speaks to the second thing you said, which is closing the loop on giving, which I think that's probably more important than how people give is if somebody, if they're moved to give, how do you show them the impact of their gift quickly? Like, how do you move them shoulder to shoulder with your cause? And, you know, I challenge every organization that if somebody gives you uh, a gift, you should be able to quickly turn around and tell them this is how your gift was used. Not just the numbers and the metrics, though they're important, but like, here's a story of impact. Like, this is real. And I want to move you in close to the cause and show you, show you how your gift changed the world. And what that's going to do is like, that's going to raise the amount of gifts. It's going to make your retention way higher. One of the biggest problems we face as nonprofits right now isn't just how people give the gift, but the, the fact they don't give a second gift, right? 75% right. of the time, they're not giving the second gift. And that closing the loop on giving and showing them the why, that's the thing, sort of the innovation you use technology to do that, right? But that I think that's the big thing, especially through COVID, that more organizations are leaning into that's actually like truly moving the needle. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, you know, I think back to a time when I was running an organization called Liberty North Korea. It was in the, in the early years, it was really hard to raise funds. And I came from Invisible Children where, you know, it was like hard to get people not to give. And, and so there was just this drastic change. And a lot of it came down to perception of like most people, when they thought of North Korea, they thought of like political, you know, rhetoric. They thought of nuclear weapons. They, they thought of North Korea, the entire country as an enemy state. And so when, when you're, you know, had the opportunity to donate to a charity that was working in North Korea, people are like, what the hell? Like, what am I doing? You know, why would I give to an, a, a country like this? And it, was, it wasn't until we really started focusing on on the actual people themselves, you know, the, the individuals, whether it's like the triumph, the struggle, um, the challenges that they were facing, how they were actually producing their own change inside the country. It wasn't until we were able to really capture and tell that story well, uh, that we saw just a huge shift in and sort of perception and the, and the way people started to respond through, you know, uh, through, through their giving. And so could not believe more in what you just said around really like focusing on, on the, on the why versus, I mean, obviously the how is important, but in terms of for incremental change, but in terms of exponential growth, focusing on the why is probably going to be your, your greatest sort of lever for change. And, and so I appreciate that and, and have seen that and witnessed that firsthand. So how, how do tech companies help with that, right? There's, I mean, there's a lot, obviously there's, there's a lot of aspects of that that don't require tech, but from your perspective, where can tech support an organization in, in achieving this greater emphasis on, on the why? Yeah, I think for us, and you know, I have some bias here because this is the problem we're trying to solve largely, but I think one is that you have an amazing opportunity to actually know who your donors are and what they care about, right? So the typical nonprofit historically is your donors have been sort of these nameless, faceless rows in a database and they all get blasted out the exact same thing. Well, now you can look at your data. You can look at how your donors are acting on your web, 
website. You can see what they're clicking on on your email. You can see what campaigns they've given to. You can see where they're engaging. You can look at third party data like demographic data and wealth data and get a pretty holistic picture of like, this is who this person is. This is what they care about. And then you can use things like automation and other sort of modern technology to respond more quickly, right? So if somebody gives to a malaria campaign and not a water campaign, rather than blasting them out a generic receipt 90 days after their gift, you can now follow up on multiple channels like text, email, mail, with messages that all correspond to what made them give. Like, I see you care deeply about malaria. Like, let us tell you on multiple channels, a story, why your gift is making an impact in the world. It's, without technology, that sort of follow-up and personalization was functionally impossible even 20 years ago, where now for the first time, nonprofits can understand who their donors are at scale and then use technology to follow up quickly with the right message at the right time. And that just, that wasn't a thing. Even when I first started in fundraising, that wasn't a thing. Oh yeah, and I remember, <laughs> I remember early on back at Liberty North Korea, you know, when we were trying to communicate with uh, our, our all of our different fundraisers, we were doing peer to peer fundraising, but we wanted to speak to, we wanted to create different sort of like milestone tracks, right? So yeah. underperformers and, and people who've signed up but didn't really raise anything. Messaging is very different. Individuals who've raised between you know one and twenty four percent, and so on. And there's really no way at the time with technology to, to do that other than to manually export you know, splice the data up manually. Uh, we had a dedicated full-time person just doing that uh, so that we could communicate, you know, with just, and we were just using email at the time. So it was just to create, just communicate email. And so you had to think about all the different, you know, channels that, that donors are, are active on today across social media, across, you know, email, SMS and so forth and to personalize content. Uh, there hasn't been a better time in history for a nonprofit to, to really be able to do that. It's a lot of the strengths that Virtuous brings to the table uh, with with your guys' responsive platform and so forth. And so speaking of, of Virtuous and Fundraise, I'd actually love to spend the next few minutes talking about uh, our partnership. I don't know why it's taken us so long uh, to come together and partner with, with Virtuous because you guys have a killer product, a killer platform, and an amazing team. And I know a lot of our team members know each other as, as well. But we're really excited to, to launch this, this integration, which... Uh, which is going to look like at a high level, you know, fundraising is a giving platform specifically around peer to peer and virtuous, the CRM donor management and, and, and so forth. So I'd love to hear kind of from your perspective, sort of any excitement or, you know, how you, how do you think this partnership can help strengthen your existing customer base and their fundraising and, and vice versa? I'm happy to share some as well, but yeah, I'd love to get your thoughts on, on this partnership and what you're looking forward to the challenges and problems that we're going to try to solve together here. Yeah. Well, one of the big sort of challenges that technology can solve that I didn't mention is, there's kind of been a breakdown in trust in institutions. I think a lot of nonprofits realize when they talk about them all the time, like instead of their donor or making it more personal, like it's hard to fundraise. People just won't give to a nameless, faceless institution the way they used to. What they will give to is a friend, right? And so the more you can think about your donors as not just a checkbook or an ATM machine, but whole people with networks and influence and friends, like, that is a key to unlock a massive amount of generosity. And so one of the things about uh, fundraise that we're really excited about is just a more integrated peer to peer experience. Right. And so mobilizing your donors as actual people with friends and networks to go out and tell the story of your organization, and your cause, but tell it through their voice to their friends and family and network. It's huge. It's huge for donor acquisition. It's huge for retention. It can really move the needle. And why I'm excited about this partnership is having that data fully connected through your CRM system actually gives you real visibility. So you're not just running some peer to peer campaign in a silo anymore. You actually have visibility to how your donors are behaving through their entire donor journey. So now within your CRM, you can say like, Hey, uh, I want to mobilize a big campaign in Texas next week. Who are all the people there that are big advocates for our organization? Who's been involved in a peer to peer campaign, right? And it just, it changes how you can relate and be more personal with donors and it opens up massive donor acquisition channels. And so I think like peer to peer and the kind of stuff you guys do and the, the digital sophistication that you empower nonprofits with is massive, but I just think it becomes that much more amplified when it's fully connected to your system of record, sort of your CRM, so you can use it through the whole donor journey. 
Yeah, absolutely. You know, on the on the acquisition side, I think that like you know when you, when you think about when we think about acquisition of any kind, you know, we, we it usually typically starts with like brand, right? Your your brand helps kind of capture demand, and in this case, and your fundraisers are an extension of your brand, capturing demand, trying to trying to figure out who else is interested in the things that I care about. Often, your closest you know circle of friends and family members have very similar interests in, in what you're interested in. And then as, as that data is captured and, and integrated into the CRM and, and allows the organization then to really convert that demand into more meaningful opportunities you know, down, down the road. And so I think that's an exciting, what's exciting to me about this partnership is the ability to have this sort of full circle solution from, from the front end on the donor acquisition side, all the way to the closing the loop, and then being able to you know, convert some of the, some of of these individuals, these new donors, uh, to become lifelong supporters of the organization. I think when we when we think about you know donor retention rates, uh, I think that when you look at specifically donors who are acquired through peer to peer, those are like those donors are are even harder to acquire. Uh, you know, in year two and three and four, uh, because a lot of times, yes, they 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 may care about the cause, but they're giving because a friend asked them to do so, and and they want to respect that. And so uh, by having that information live in a, in a powerful and dynamic CRM, I think is going to be interesting to see how those donors retain year over year uh, and, and so forth. One of the things we've seen too, this is just a general trend, but like, yeah, I like when nonprofits are more de-siloed. So there's sort of like not just one person fundraising or, or major donor and they're sort of a necessary evil in their own little bucket within the organization. And it's funny how even tech tools like fundraise broaden an organization's ability to engage across departments and more holistically. So by that, I mean, historically you'd run a campaign and there'd be, you have like three major donor guys. And so the big donors are going to go through those guys and everything else is going to go through a single page on your website that your webmaster helped you put together. Right. And so, but that's not really the way it works anymore. So with a tool like fundraise connected all of a sudden, it's like, man, our, you know, our volunteer team has this one-off idea for a crazy campaign landing page. They want to stand up really quick to get a bunch of volunteers giving on this one-off event. Like that's possible for the first time ever, right? We have our program staff actually want to help run little fundraisers themselves to their friends and family and people that are coming through. Like they can stand up their individual, they can all be fundraisers, right? Now the whole organization is centered around generosity in ways that weren't possible. And so that's one of the things I'm really excited about with Fundraise as well. Absolutely. And so for, for those listening, for Fundraise customers, super easy to turn this integration on. Uh, obviously, you need to have a virtuous account. And so if you don't have a virtuous account, we'll definitely direct you in the, in the right direction there. But it's, a, it's an OAuth integration directly from our integrations tab. And for virtuous customers, good news is Fundraise is free software. Uh, so you don't pay for the software. There's different levels of support. And so you can get access to world-class fundraising technology for uh, essentially free, effectively free. You can learn more about uh, through the partnership as, as well. Gabe, thank you so much for joining the podcast today and, and sharing a little bit more about responsive fundraising, virtuous, and just all things nonprofit. Uh, always good to catch up and, and talk with you. That's great. Thanks so much for having me, Justin. It's been a delight. Absolutely.